Hey kids, John here. This is part two of the interview that I did with Javier Gonzalez. Fantastic young uh, Los Angeles based lead player and just a fantastic trumpet player. And the information that's contained in this video series of this interview with Javier is incredible because he developed his own system of figuring out how to play in the upper register. When you went from the lead pipe, then started, you know, moving into the upper register on the horn, what kind of things were you working on that really helped you take what you'd grasped on the, on the lead pipe and put them into that register? Well, what I did was actually the, the, the method, the major arpeggios and scales that I was using on the trumpet with the lead pipe by itself, mm. I would then start doing that with the whole setup to, to have some familiarity with uh, the lead pipe and then the whole trumpet assembly. First, I'm going to do the major arpeggio. I'll do two octave major arpeggio, mm -hmm. and then do it with the trumpet assemble. First, I'll need five, so. And now with the trumpet. So essentially, through the lead pipe, you're able to, if I may use the word, teach yourself the slotting mm -hmm. or the placement of the notes that are sitting up there. Yeah. I mean, is that fair to say? It is, but there's other things that are involved as well. Okay. Because you get a certain different, res well, you get a, a massive different uh, resistance when the when the tuning slide is put back in there. Right, yeah. So, what I've learned is because the lead pipe at first was so difficult because there's so much more air getting in there that yeah. when you put in the lead pipe or tuning slide back in there, there's more resistance so you realize how much less air you need to make that top note happen. Interesting. So it's, it's, a, it's a mental game like when you're doing endurance running. You know, you mm -hmm. run further than your competition requires you to. So when you get to the competition, you have more than enough energy to get there. Right, <laughs> it's, it. it's the same thing. You're just tricking your body to, to, to realize that that note, even though it's high, is not as hard as it is in the lead pipe as it is in the trumpet. <laughs> so in, in, the, in conquering the area above that F, mm -hmm. um, did you do the same type of things on the lead pipe? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's actually really, it, <laughs> that's really impressive. Well, you know, I mean, it is. You know, because that's that's that because the lead pipe is that's it offers such a different concept because your mm. brakes are gigantic. Yes, they are. But that's the beauty of it because they are big, and you you sometimes you can't help but just fall into the slot because the horn will, or the lead pipe won't let you. Right. The fact that you work so hard to make that slot essentially disappear when you're actually going to that extreme register and and play with the, with the trumpet fully assembled, you realize that you need less air to achieve the same thing you were doing on, the, on the, just the lead pipe. Interesting. So it's again, it's a mental thing. Right. Can you give us uh, just a little love up above that air? Sure, do sure. So I'll do there. the lead pipe again first. Okay, wow, great. Here, now put this down so you can get the view. Yeah, no problem. That should be, I should have ended on the F. Hopefully I didn't go up a step. There you go. Not bad. All right, so now, that was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not gonna do on the trumpet, and it's gonna, hopefully it will sound less difficult. Mm -hmm. And if you notice, it wasn't really loud. Right. And it was in tune, and it was accurate. The A was clear. Right. Uh, ascending and descending. Yeah. And granted, I was using more cheeks that time, of the cheek muscles, but I did that to in order to use less volume. Okay. And I, you know, it's so funny because I, 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 especially if I'm doing like a you know a shake a do we you know mm -hmm. I, I find that. 
kind of cheek nose kind of thing mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know how to explain what that's doing. Well, what do you start hurting after, what starts hurting after your stomach starts hurting from laughing? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Right cheeks. there. Cheeks. Because you're, you're, you got, you're, mm -hmm. yeah, you're doing that. You're, you're pulling, pulling these up and kind of back. And yeah. So when I work on exercises that are really demanding, I can sometimes, when I'm actually really confident and, and, and really warmed up, like this exercise. Doing it up in the octave is kind of easier because hmm. I'm incorporating these muscles. So for example, yeah, let's see that. How important do you, do you, or how much weight, I don't know how to put this question exactly, but how important are those lip flexibility studies? Oh, very important. Okay. Because the whole, the whole, at least for me, even though the whole purpose for them is not to incorporate the tongue, because mm. it's, it's more about filling in sound or you're going up and down. Mm -hmm. But for me, when I, something happened years ago where it just triggered because I was doing the lead pipe, that tongue placement is key to make everything either sound smooth or abrupt. So when you, when you go, that's aggressive. Mm -hmm. But you can also go, mm -hmm. very smooth. So your, your tongue placement actually makes it more aggressive or very smooth. Yeah, how hard you're, you're moving that. Yeah, yeah right. and, and, and the cheek muscles also help yeah. in making it more aggressive or less aggressive. It's interesting to watch you do that because you do activate that. Mm. You know, I mean, I, I've had to you know, edit and watch some of my videos so I get to see what I do. And I sometimes mm. wonder if I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing. Mm. But it just, it happens. I don't think about it. It activates yeah. and it helps me get achieve what mm -hmm. I'm trying to do. And you know what? That's also, it works against that too because sometimes when we have bad habits, right? things that we don't notice are activating but until you watch yourself, <laughs> right? you realize, okay, that sounds like that because I see what I'm doing. Yes. You can actually see what's happening that either is, it looks painful <laughs> uh, <laughs> but or, or that you, you see what's working. Okay. Uh, uh, my, my teacher in middle school uh, taught me to look in the mirror when you practice exercise, you know, when you're doing chromatics, or when you're doing slurs, or when you're doing tongue checks, so you see what's happening, mm -hmm. uh, what's working and what's not working. When you have that visual of that, it yeah. works great. Yeah, it helps, yeah. So, um, in, in the in the process of doing the slurs, it, it, it helps us connect things and, mm -hmm. and, and really understand our, I guess, slotting and, and, and how we're getting up and down. Yeah. The question that I have for you is, Watching you play, is is there a stumbling block for you uh, when you're playing bigger intervals up there? I mean, mm -hmm. what's what's that like? How how have you overcome dealing with the intervallic, you know, odd? Because lead parts can you know, people write some really interesting things yeah. for lead players. Yeah. So how do you deal with the intervallic kind of challenges of playing in that upper register? Well, I mean, there's a lot of books out there that help with 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 dealing with large intervals. This Chinese instrument player named Ba Lin, B-A-I-L-I-N, has this great method book. Uh, it's called Lip Flexibilities. And uh, that one deals a lot with, with large intervals. Like, for example, and the whole book comprises of stuff like that. And he keeps expanding it to, I think, the highest he goes is to a high E. Okay. And he is a classical player. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing B-flat exercises. Right. Um, so doing those, I did the method where you go up to the high E and then I just expanded on that. When you start expanding to those larger intervals, the best method to do it is take that same exercise, add more range to it, and just do it slower and softer. Keyword mm. being softer. Because if you can do it soft, you can do it louder. Mm, nice. And it's all, just, it's all just learning mainly muscle memory. And one more question on that type of intervallic and challenges in the in the upper register. Mm. When I activate tonguing, it can it can upset the apple cart a little bit because you have this increased explosion of air when you're when you're doing the tonguing. And mm. and 
have you worked on that type of control of tonguing things as well? Yeah. What do you do to, to, to get control over that? Um, one exercise that's fantastic and I'm pretty sure everybody knows about it is the scales from James Stamp. Mm. You know, where it's just that... Of course, not doing it that fast. Right, right, uh, right. But, you know, just, you have to develop with it. You know, when you, when you go up to the high range, you have to start... Wasn't the best example, but you have to start soft and articulate and just make sure everything, all the articulation is there with the full sound. And soft, because if you can do it soft, you can do it loud. So when you do those, you, you ultimately take them quite a ways up into your register. I try to. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, on an unrelated, you know, non, you know, how do you do it type mm -hmm. of thing, is it challenging to be a lead player? <laughs> in the LA area um I mean you know I've heard stories of you know if if you don't have a double C all day long don't bother showing up well actually a lot of guys say uh, lately I've been getting this sort of thing if you have don't bring your double C's in because I don't want to see it on paper anymore <laughs> 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 you know but I always tell them like you know at the moment that's kind of how I get my work okay. just the fact that I that I have a range they can write for and that I'm able to do other things where they can keep, keep writing for me. And again, that's how I got my work at first, is I, you have to come into LA with something that somebody, not that they can't do it, but something that, that, that sort of makes you shine. But there's just something different that somebody notices about me that does set me aside. So you have something that you, you're bringing something to the plate. You're yeah. bringing something to the table. I mean, and again, it's, it's not something that nobody can do. Right. You know, the, you know, my biggest hero, like, who I studied with as well, is Wayne Bergeron. That guy can play double C's probably all day. You know? Right, sure. But, you know, he's, he's a busy man. This concludes part two, and there is one more part of this series of the interview that I did with Javier Gonzalez. So please check that out.